changes or additions to the agenda as presented? Uh, yes, after the planning commission, uh, we need a few minutes for a presentation by the Lamoille Fiber Net. Any other changes or additions? Start reviewing the invoices and orders. Okay, first invoice is all things asphalt for $11,500. Some of the work we had done around the village and town. Yeah. Library. Okay. Uh, if I recall, Jason, there was no changes to the work that they did. It's exactly what we have. Okay. It just occurs to me, Aaron, we should probably, <laughs> maybe not tonight, because I'm not prepared for this, I know, but we should probably match the amount to the, what we approved to do. As a matter of practice, we approved a certain amount. Yep, good idea. Okay, so that one's the whole particular item. Yep. Okay, next one is the uh, Grasso fuel uh, for a total of $2,136.73. Sorry, a total of $2,865.95. And that is for one, two, three, four line items. Mike, are you able to hear us? Uh, fairly well. Okay. Let me know if you want me to speak up. I don't think I need to speak up, do I? No, nope. nope. we can hear you. Uh, <laughs> next is Charlotte, uh, Rising Crowns, uh, Wood Fire Oven, 140. Discussion on that one? Uh, it's cheese. Oh, shred. It's cheese. Cheese. Yeah, sorry. It is. <laughs> shred blend is cheese. We've got to figure it out. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, city Parks. Um, postage for City Parks. Seven. Program, what is programs, Rosemary? Library programs. <laughs> Library programs, 1902. Books on tape, 2204. Grant fund purchases, uh, $532.72. Building maintenance and repair supplies, 2540. Building and supplies, 1987. Professional training, $1,299.90. <laughs> okay, and then office supplies for twelve ninety nine, and due from the town or village nineteen eighty seven for a total of nineteen seventy two fifty eight. Okay. Being processed and consolidated. Uh, consolidated communications total. Okay. Okay. Um, Jeff Horse, Profane and Heat for the Holcomb, $20 and two cents. Okay. Um, Home Country Center, matching for the oven is uh, $270.96. Uh, county funding <laughs> is 105. <laughs> I'm glad you're not here, Mike. <laughs> you should have a new button on this. Yeah, you should be able to mute this out. A wood fire oven. Is that is that what it's for? Yes. Are you about the cheese? No, the valley flash. I think I thought about that. That should be real trip. Wood valley. Oh, Not the wood of it. No, it should be this. Real trip. No, because we had to rebuild. We had to rebuild. Uh, okay, so it's just lowest in life. And the green one. Excellent. Okay. Okay. 
Um, county public and heating, ground maintenance, and dues from the village, and switch level 10507. Great big graphics, world cow sign, beautification, city 14160. Uh, Donna Griffiths, admin costs $40. For the skate park meeting, it looks like. Um, Duncan, lumber for the top, whatever that is. Uh, the trailhead building, okay. Uh, 24662. And that's what that building should be put at, right? Yes. Um, the Han welding supply, parts and supplies, 1085. That's for uh, cycle maintenance and requalification. I guess that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ingram books, books on tape and grant fund purchases for a total of seven hundred eighty-three dollars and twenty-two cents. Um, Johnson Farming Rental um, Conservation Conserve Mix for forty seventy-two. Gift card gymnastics for thirty dollars. What is that, Rosemary? They gave a gift card to one of the seniors, I believe. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, zip anchors for the buildings and grounds, extension cord for buildings and grounds, um, wasp and hornet spray for site maintenance and repair. Those are 738, 248, and 349, respectively. Um, cover. And latex primer for site and maintenance repair for 2954. A power bit for site and maintenance repair for 4288. And weed and grass killer for the trail club building and the baseball fields for a total of 4089. Um, new invoice, also a jump and farm garden. Uh, there's no honors for parts and supplies, 2789. Any question on that? Take it out or no? Okay. Uh, handy pack 15089. Uh, guard stakes 4333. Roof flashing for the, this is put under wood fire oven. Should that also be the truck? Mm -hmm. Uh, for 637, mini excavator for construction cost 417. Uh, uh, Kent Stearns, edger for the fields, uh, facilities and maintenance $40. Doug Moldy, timber for the trailhead, uh, $305.25. Uh, sanding gravel stone, $2,256.54. Uh, right to use tables, assessor expense, New England municipal, $462.70. What is that, Rosemary? We have to every year um, renew Marshall Swift tables as part of the year of these items. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Hauling for gravel stone. Dale Percy, eleven thousand dollars, nine hundred and twenty. Sorry, eleven thousand nine hundred twenty dollars. Is that the stone you need for the box lot job? Box lot. Between box lot and the French Hill. Good. Okay. Uh, see. Rabbit tracks mowing for conservation expense, uh, $780. Invasive plant control for the conservation committee expense, $300. Uh, stamp for $54.25. Public work supplies for printing and publishing, $179.04. That's to the store reporter. Dale Tetro, sidewalk at the building here, $2,900. So that one is, is that split or did we do that? It's already split. Uh, credit card, office supplies, $17.99, facilities and maintenance, 
4512 and soccer, $696.63. Uh, baseball, $76.16 and basketball, $33.07. So the tech group contract that we just signed is part of the regular expense we have listed here. The Historical Society membership, $50. Uh, Add-on items to the truck outside repairs and parts for to Viking uh, for $830. Uh, village. That, a new truck? that was a lot of the new cannon. Uh, school at Legion Field Electricity, 2651, just the village. Uh, light, heat, tape, electricity, 4776. Sinclair Road Light, Street Lights, um, 6724. Holcomb Electricity, 7820. Lower Main Electricity, uh, a negative 10129. And then also a charge of uh, 25173. Uh, Village Water and Sewer. The library, 5109. Railroad Street, 5589. Railroad uh, Street, second year, 7376. Westcombe State Park, 2452. Beach and Fuel, $5. Uh, Railroad at Rail. At Trail, um, sorry, Railroad Street Trail Foundation Oversight, 512, 188 Lower Main East, 6722. Uh, and then Dean West, uh, expense for, he's been a lot of expense for trailer under buildings and grounds, 3411. Do you know what that is? No. Oh, Is there any further questions on the orders? And the, <coughs> the payroll, I'm assuming the manager of each department ensures that the hours are correct. Signed up. Does, any, does Mike have any questions from his end? I have a copy of the report. Thank you. Mike, did you have questions? No. Thanks. Okay. Uh, is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for October 4th and October 11th? You're missing the October 11th meeting minutes. Uh, I think it goes up to you. Oh, okay. So it'd be just October 4th? Yes. So, motion, we have a second. I'll second. We have a second. Any discussion? Any concern? Particular no, I just have it right up. Any other concerns? Discussion? Anything from Mike? You're, you're monitoring if he raises his hand. Mike, yeah. Here. Seeing none, all those in favor, say by the same aye. Aye. Opposed? I'll abstain because I was not at that meeting. No, so we'll do a roll call. Mike is uh, abstaining. Beth is abstaining. Evan, how do you vote? Aye. Matt, how do you vote? Aye. And the vote folks, aye as well. Motion passes. Rosemary, go ahead. You got the floor. I'm passed out of the current year budget staff report. We haven't had time to put the actual budget figures in. And we'll get that done next week and we'll send it over in that. Can you send that electronically in Excel? Please? Okay. Anybody else want to Excel besides Ben? I'll do it. Yeah. What is it? PDF in Excel. Yeah. Okay. 
Current taxes up to today were at 40% total, which is slightly above the previous two years. We have a list of the income taxes. Currently, the poll is for that year. I haven't had a chance to talk with Jim Barlow yet. I will do that before we get ready to do an announcement. And the boosters have a errors and omissions on the green list. <coughs> um, they accidentally um, build a property to Green Mountain Club that was only an easement from the state of Vermont. It was at thirty-five thousand two hundred dollars. How much? Thirty-five thousand two hundred dollars of value. They no, assessed it to the assessed to the Green Mountain Green Mountain Club. And it's it should be the state. They only did a conservation easement. So you need from the board acceptance of their uh, change. Change. Yeah. Board's pleasure. So moved. Okay, motion. We have a second. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, since I was saying aye. 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 Both. Okay. That's the sign. And did Mike <coughs> want to vote on that one? <coughs> oh, you. So. Okay, Mike, did you want to vote on that? Yes. I, I keep getting muted because I'm coughing. Okay. So did you vote in favor? Yes. So record show motion pass. Is there anything else? Today I received the um, maps for the district reapportionment. Uh, yeah. right. Going down to a one member with Belvedere and Water. That's a PCA meeting. It's, it's a proposal, so it can still change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's not good for us. Well, that's the way I read it. They're suggesting one member. Oh, the Eden, which is good. Yeah, that's quite an interesting question. And I think Wolfett was with Elmore and the Fire and Horse Um, I, I sort of was uh, surprised we didn't see anything from the Senate yet. They didn't, it must be a different committee. No, this is an independent uh, legislative committee. Well, it's from the appointed committee. Right, it's appointed committee, but I thought they would have one at least make a suggestion on both. But. I guess they're only on the House side. We should have something from the Senate. Oh, it's in the Senate. Okay. All the way up. Questions, Rosary? Oh, Brian and I have to work on that policy for reimbursement on um, expenses. It's going to be like something. Okay. There's no further questions from the Rosemary. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you, Jason, on your first official meeting as the new uh, public works supervisor. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And not only that, but we got an email praising Jason, Jason McCrew earlier today, too. On your first select board night. <laughs> now we've set the bar for you. <laughs> Uh, so we completed the paving project from all things last whole Friday. So that's all we did all the landscaping at the library today and got that finished. So I put all the completions up top. And the current project we got going on is Fox Lot Snow. My current project up there is going to be completed by the end of October. So that's going to be our main focus for the next week. So I'll finish up and then focus at the same time. Limited staff. And I was going to ask about the. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to get the staff. Never 
and had a second area. So I'd like to set for it. Okay. Was that in your That's in the uh, expected purchases. Uh, there's a typo in there. It lists them as $3,500. It's not $3,500, it's for a RAM 3500 $3, okay. The vehicle number is 3500 The tires themselves will cost about 1000 And that's, you'll be going over that? Yeah. In your report, okay. So you're just putting on record that you'd like some new tires? Yeah, <clears throat> I, well, I guess we both work together on the report, kind of, I don't want to keep it better. I made a new, Report my report. I made because I wanted to add the asphalt thing. When I did the first one, they hadn't uh, shown up yet, so I wanted to include that. There's two other things that we changed, but nothing major. Um, obviously, I can't speak for the whole board, but I do like this format. It's uh, it's very easy to look at, to look at um, what you've accomplished, what you're doing, what you plan to do. It's, I like it. Uh, so are we going off the one? Like you printed this one out, so we have one in pack. One I printed. <clears throat> okay. And one I gave Brian, and he put in the bag. He was like, give it to him early, put it in the pack, and he was making it. At the time, he gave me so I got put in the food, and it's a tight one. So do you still want to discuss the overtime for rocket fire? Or it was just on your original and it's not here? No. I do. I talked to uh, Brian a little bit about it. I discuss it with you guys. Um, so we hire somebody that can be, uh, be kind of convenient for us to, if they could, if they're willing to work in or okay with it, just putting some extra hours over in this grant project. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on overtime? You know? We're doing fine, but it's the beginning of the year. We, we haven't gone through winter day. yet, so yes. We have lots available, but we know we're going to need an unknown significant amount of like, How much are you looking at? For, yeah, I think they, they were they were uh, for willing to work an extra two hours or so a day for two or three days a week with some people that were trying to project with but the board's thoughts. I think we're four thousand one hundred and sixty hours short of what the crew had last year. So they're going to be for it longer if they're willing to. Yeah, definitely. Just, my only hesitation would be one of you guys rest up for the winter. You know, you don't put it on the side. I agree with Matt, and you know, we should go to the we're not finding things to do, but if we have a long list and a couple hours makes a difference, then sure. Yeah, that's that was the only thing that we're going to have to do. Oh, okay. Putting the grant project, not anything else. So I just want to make sure we have a great There's a lot of things to follow up. Yes. Okay. Did the unknown point for what Jason was asking extra overtime availability? For Mark and Brian, yeah. and Mike has any comments? But what? Uh, no, Mike. <laughs> He's going to do. I'm having a real difficult time hearing you, folks. Did, and I've did, turned up all the way to. Did you hear what I summarized? Just uh, sum it up in a nutshell, would you? Basically, uh, Jason's looking for uh, authorization from the board to use uh, Mark and uh, Ryan to get some overtime to finish up the grant uh, on Fox Law. The grant. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want to specific? We don't want to just open up an overtime. I think we're saying a couple hours a day for the next five weeks. Yeah, but I don't want to be, you know, Ryan has certainly made that you can't work overtime for 30% of the year. So it only did, it's not going to be that much. You'll be like, we'll make it over 10 hours a week, you know, together for five hours. Project has to be closer to two weeks. That is the only deadline. You have to have them in 30% of the
almost not by right. that's good. Otherwise, someone now 30 hours a week. They're not in violation of the 300 yet anyway, or two whatever hours. Yeah, th this is still this is all still well within the normal operation of the supervisor position. It's more of board awareness that we are spending a little bit more than our usual amount of overtime before okay. winter. I, I thought we were starting the clock on one of ours. So, okay, good. No, I just wanted to yep. uh, oh, I think so. there's a consensus on we've got to get this grant job done a little more. You know, be a sensitive challenge. Okay, anything else? I have a question. Um, do you have an update on grading of all the roads? I know we had talked a couple weeks ago about getting all the roads graded. Uh, we had completed almost two of them a uh, week and a half ago. And then Mark's been in the carving out on uh, the grant project. So I'm hoping within the next week and a half, he can go back up and we're going to grade every road again before in the wintertime, hopefully, if not. Most of you so I think yeah, this um it's a bit of time. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just asking my road happens to be one that was not one of the two. <laughs> but, okay. Okay. Any further questions? Mike, do you have any questions of Jason? No. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Paul, you've got the floor. I understand you're giving the Planning Commission report and kicking off the fiber net for present day. Yeah, you ever come to you first? Can we Planning Commission report first, then kick off. Okay. Would you like the lights turned down in the rest of the room? Maybe. Well, you guys tell me. I need to change. Uh, yeah, that's not going to show up remotely at all. Right. <coughs> I can do him. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> we can just do every other one. Uh, I guess I could do the other. This really, there's the uh, draft town policy that the planning commission has written, and there's also some specific recommendations about some of the classical roads. The they're both in our minutes. If you want to read them in detail, um, as far as the policy, uh, the planning commission drafted policy in 2020. The select board sent it back to us with some red line comments, and 
and this is our response to your response. So, uh, for the most part, we attempted to find as much common ground as we could to avoid a lot of back and forth. So there's only a few specific parts I'm going to highlight uh, tonight. <clears throat> Item three in the town policy is oddly enough an old town policy, go figure. Um, and currently, this basically says that the town does not do any maintenance on class four roads, winter or summer. Um, and while that's true, the town's not obligated to do anything other than bridges and culverts. Um, the planning commission felt pretty strongly that we should be taking a more proactive approach. The intent should be to do maintenance regularly in order to maintain the structure of those roads. So our proposed wording is, as you see up there, um, we think that the policy of town should be to have the road for a person, survey the class four roads and trails annually, determine what needs to be done, and make every effort to actually do that work. Um, recognizing that there's obviously uh, budget considerations and flavor considerations and equipment considerations, but nonetheless, the intent should be to do work every year to try to maintain the structure. Town for, uh, class four roads are an asset, and you know, we can't just let them deteriorate. So that's the, the recommendation for that uh, wording in that section. Another less important section, but just one that kind of stuck out to us is in regards to snow plowing. Currently, the policy says that a permit is required to plow on a class four road. As far as we can determine, nobody seems to get permits and it seems to work pretty well the way it is currently. So our recommendation is that that may not really be necessary. Uh, a lot of roads, I think there's more than one person plowing, and if one person has a permit, another doesn't. It's sort of an awkward situation. So, our feeling is landowners, tenants, contracted help to be able to plow class four roads without a permit. And one of the last items in the uh, policy is with respect to disputed right of ways, and there was some back and forth on this issue as to you know, who's got the burden of proof. And I think our compromise wording is that uh, if there's a dispute, we think it should be the town's obligation to mark or flag where the right way is based on the maps where the town thinks it is. And then if there's a dispute, it's up to the complainant to prove otherwise. Uh, that seemed like a reasonable uh, sharing of responsibilities. So that was our recommendation for that. And we did also add some penalties for non compliance, which uh, were somehow a bid from our 2020 draft you wrote a long time ago. So they're now included as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through any detail, but it's just to give it some teeth so that the town has some recourse. So that's it for the policy part. The uh, hospital road recommendations, a little bit of just quick history. Um, and this is all sending back 64, which is trying to reduce the amount of erosion coming from town roads. And the part we're specifically concerned about is this municipal roads general permit um, that deals with uh, reduction in stormwater. And it basically says that the town has got to make a multi-year plan and do quite a bit of work. And potentially, just to get town equipment into some areas of classical roads to do that work would be expensive, not unwinding the work itself. Um, so, with that said, uh, legal trails are exempt from Max 64 at this time. So there's some discussion as to is that a way around some of this expense. Um, <clears throat> so after a bit of chasing our tail and trying to figure out how to best approach this and survey the roads and so on and so forth, we ended up working with the road erosion inventory report that uh, the Royal County Planning Commission did. And what they did is look at all the roads decide which road segments, and road segment is 300 feet, which road segments are hydrologically connected um, and which are not. And if they are hydrologically connected, then do the erosion controls in place meet uh, road control standards, uh, partially meet or not meet at all. And then, uh, so we then, we, that gave us a uh, group of roads to look at. Within Johnson, uh, we have 10 class four roads that have segments that are classified, that are classified as hydrologically connected, but only four of those have sections that uh, do not meet or 
on the parsley. And those four are the ones that are centered there. So jumping right into those. And I will say, uh, jump in and say, I'll be thank you to Charlie Gallagher for taking all these uh, photos from Milson East. A lot of persuading, but anyway. Um, so, Town Highway 47, we think down this a little bit, um, which is, you know, by Reservoir Road up, up in French Hill Road. You can see the road in question goes right through a wetland. Seems like a no brainer to reclassify that as a trail so that we're not obligated to do any kind of fancy uh, engine maintenance there. I'm not sure what the options would be other than move the road. And that just seems like a necessary expense. Um, I should point out that reclassifying something as a trail um, also does maintain a down right away. So we're not losing any access, we're just avoiding this road control expense. <laughs> The next one is Hoi Road. I'm going to zoom in on that. And well, actually, before I do that, I'm zoom in on that. Looking at the legend down at the lower left for a second, um, you can see a color coded it. It doesn't show terribly well there, but the top one is red, it's not meat. Orange is partially meats. Green is fully meats. White is not hydrologically connected at all, so it's no concern. And yellow is incomplete data. It means whoever was doing the survey didn't get out of the truck or didn't, uh, didn't survey that part of the road for whatever reason. So if I. Hawaii well, Road goes from uh, Clay Hill over to 100C, and there's only a very short section uh, that's classified, it does not need. It's where a little intermittent stream crosses the road and, and goes down to the downgraded wetland that you can see there. Um, so our recommendation is to classify just those two sections as trail, leave the rest of it as class four road. The rest of it provides uh, good access to private property areas so that they want to build on, they want to develop, what have you. Uh, part of the discussion, this is a good example of it that we had is. How do you reclassify roads while minimize, minimizing any impact on private property values? And you know, initially we were taking this broad brush and saying, well, it's a big old thing trail, it's a big trail. What about the person who lives up in? You know, what has that done to their property values now? So this is a good example where yeah, you could just turn the whole thing into a trail, you could turn uh, one into the other into a trail, or idea is just do those two road segments. They're identified. So that was our thinking there. Uh, Crossroads Rock. Okay, this one's a little bit different. Um, there is this one section. It's classified as partially meets current state of road control standards. And what I'm thinking here is that there's a lot of seasonal use, a lot of year round use, pardon me, of this road for recreational purposes. And right now, the burden for maintaining the road is falling to the property owners up there. And particularly after most season and during most season, that gets pretty onerous. Um, we would like to see the town consider uh, reclassifying Prospect Rock Road from uh, back up to the indicated. Sites whose numbers I've forgotten. Um, up to 153 to 676, which is where the parking is for hiking at the Prospect Rock. Make that all class three road. This would be a significant undertaking. But now that the infrastructure money available, uh, it seems like a good time to at least think about it. This would obviously require a couple of landowners up there. Um, maybe the road might need to be widened in some spots and so on and so forth. But it uh, seems like it would really increase accessibility to a town asset or a town resource, as you probably said, and that's just prospect rock for recreational purposes. So that's the thought with that one. And the last one is Mine Road. 
And this also was nice to do on nine road burns from 100 C up by the fairgrounds and next week. Uh, it's up in Overhill. There's only a short section of three segments classified as does not meet, and it happens to be immediately adjacent to the extension of it, which is already legal trail one. So it seems like a no brainer to just extend that legal trail to include those sections. And that was a nice simple one. Uh, that is the extent of the specific recommendations. Um, this table just summarizes what I just said, so I'm not going to read it, but it's all together. Uh, on to water and sewer line extensions. Um, we chased our tail on this one too, frankly, uh, a little bit at the start, trying to figure out um, how do you make a decision matrix that so that you as a select board or board to make these decisions would have some sort of objective criteria to say, yes, this person can buy uh, municipal water and sewer, and no, this person can't. Um, what would be your rationale be for that? Um, after working with that a little bit, we kind of took a step back and said, well, let's just philosophically, what do we think about this idea? We decided it, plenty of things over, it's advantageous to have people back um, for the reasons I said there. It's, Property values, environmental stewardship, uh, and place for revenues for the village operations. So it should be something that we should be encouraging. So with that in mind, we poked around to see what we could find, you know, what are other municipalities doing. And <clears throat> interestingly, I spoke to uh, Williston, Montpelier, and so, and it turns out none of them have a written water and sewer line extension policy. Um, all of them admitted they should, but none of them do. They all have on an ad hoc sort of basis, uh, which is sort of interesting that uh, that hasn't led to problems yet. But um, so then we uh, looked further afield to see what kind of uh, language we could come up with, and basically kind of with Dave Butler, which was suggested, a really simple overall edict that basically if there's sufficient capacity, somebody wants to buy they can, and then providing. We need to put in some caveats to protect the town. So we put a bunch of caveats in, and in the actual recommendations that are uh, in our minutes, they sent to the board. Uh, there are some specifics, but for example, sufficient capacity as defined by whom. So we said, okay, mandatory hydraulic study. The town gets to set the criteria for that study to make sure that things are properly addressed. Um, developer would bear all the costs. Uh, everything is engineered to state standards. And then a couple of interesting ones that we hadn't thought of initially but picked up from uh, other municipalities is that the, any trunk or spur lines that are built to serve more than one house would become the property of the town after an appropriate warranty period so we can make sure that everything was done up to stuff, which makes sense because somebody's got to maintain and repair and inspect and so forth these lines over time. And in addition, you need an easement to cross the property to do that. So. All that stuff is sort of built into the draft. Um, there's probably a lot more work that needs to be done, but hopefully it's, it's a decent start. And we need to also put a timeline on it just so that we wouldn't have a lot of unstarted or half done projects floating around right now. Um, as I said, there's more detail on the specific recommendations in the package, but the other two things we just want to throw out is, is I, uh, thoughts, not really part of the recommendation, but one is to consider essentially what we're talking about is pay to play. If you want to join and you're willing to meet all these criteria, you can do it. If that's blanket policy, that means like we're giving up this kind of code, which is something to consider. Um, the other thing is everything I've said so far is from the perspective of somebody approaching the town and saying, hey, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. It's separate from the town proactively deciding to want to extend it to a particular piece of property, like a joint property, for example. Or deciding we want to steer development into this area or that area. The planning commission felt it unless that's something the select board really wants us to do, we didn't really think it was our place to winners and losers, if you will, in respect to the property values. We say, you know, front water and store up the hill, but you just affected the property value there in contrast to where you chose not to go. So 
that's not something you're comfortable doing you weren't really sure if you were being asked to do. So we stay away from that for the time being at least. And the other part is um, you know, as part of this municipal extension, you know, are we trying to for a particular type of development and if so what type? And how do you do that? And that brings us around the zoning conversation, which is always fun here in town. So just other considerations to think about as part of this overall how do we extend water and sewer lines and you know those policies. That is it. Uh, a thank you to the members of the planning commission who suffered through kind of this meeting just going around in circles on some of this before we got back. Um, and I would also say one thing I'm, I'm very pleased about with planning commission is that there's um, always room for diverse opinions. We've done a really good job of hearing each other out and uh, uh, letting the board air it out. Uh, it's been quite a Let's get into that. I'm happy to take any questions or um, so, well, thank you, Paul. That was a pretty good presentation. Uh, too much information, I don't know. No, that was great. Well, was good. Evan, is that do you want any questions? You know, class four uh, policy that you were proposing was sent back to us. That's something we're gonna have to take up with you. Uh, Mike, we're back. Uh, not off the top of my head. Yeah. Just Mike, Timothy. Uh, Justin Pearson. Okay. Did you guys list the specific reason why those sections fail? Those sections are all in the AR. I'm here. Yeah. Like, I mean, right above your house, very nice house, Charlotte, there, but hydrologically, I did that. That section of Bonner Old actually failed at that snapshot in time because there was a burn from a grader. I know they're not from a grader up there, but I just I'm most slightly curious why they failed. Well, some of them were pretty obvious, like one was the wet one, or the broke across the line road and so forth. Um, but you're right, you brought up a good point. This um, uh, survey that Russell Easty did. That's supposed to be done on a five year basis. And there are parts of it, as I said, that they didn't inspect at all. So we know those parts have been revisited at some point. There are parts that we know are wrong, like Evan just said. Um, so there are certainly other issues that have come up. Um, the other two, uh, we did look at why some of them failed. And so I have to go back and look at those We could just, I can introduce you. Yeah, that's yeah. the question. Uh, they do, you're right. The maps do have some pretty good uh, but some of them are not this. Um, I have a question too, Paul. Um, yeah. On the class four right of way dispute, um, the proposal for um, the complaint to prove otherwise the town of Charles flag location, how does that compare to, to some of the towns? Is that something that is like a standard approach to dispute? Uh, for whatever reason, we didn't look at other accounts. I don't know. Okay. Um, and Brown can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I believe that the state standard is that the right of way is however many rods from the center of the road. And if the road drifts a little bit, so does the right of way. I think that would be a question at some point for some of these roads that aren't exactly how they travel. So where is that? Where is the road at all? Where much less towards the center of it? <laughs> some would be hard to determine. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, unless there's any further questions, thank you, Paul. Thank you very Paul. much. The fiber net. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. I'm your, um, I'm Charlotte River. I'm here with Paul from the Oil Fiber Net Communications Union District. Uh, we just wanted to give you a bit of an update on who we are and what we're doing uh, currently. 
Um, so the well fiber net is um, setting itself up as a service. We're trying to provide um, internet that is reliable, high speed, affordable, um, uh, locally, locally controlled uh, to every address in our member towns. Um, we're uh, aiming to provide internet that is um, high speed because we know that that's important to the region for economic, educational reasons, uh, for career um, and healthcare. Um, and as we've seen over the last year or two, especially how important that is. Um, we're looking to design a network that's uh, flexible to geographic and uh, economic needs of the region, um, especially being in a rural area. Um, we can have a network that's net neutral um, and that meets both current needs and uh, needs that may develop in future. Um, uh, the CUD was formed in July 2020. Um, our current member towns are every town in Memorial except for Elmore currently. Uh, Wolfpit is our most recent member. Uh, they joined this summer. Uh, there are nine CUDs across Vermont currently um, of varying sizes. Um, Memorial is a little bit on the smaller side, uh, just in terms of member towns. Um, the CUDs were set up initially by state legislation in 2015 to address the lack of broadband. Um, especially in rural areas of Vermont, one of the issues that arise is that uh, for-profit internet service providers don't uh, see it as being financially viable to serve many customers in rural areas because they um, operate in a model of needing a certain density of people per mile in order to run fiber or to run um, other high-speed internet forms. So um, a lot of people get left in the lurch. Uh, the CUD was developed um, by the state as a model for having a not-for-profit system where public towns could um, work together and because they're not-for-profit, um, have it be more low cost and possible to serve these areas. Uh, the CUD governing board is entirely volunteers. Uh, we're all uh, appointed by the select board of each member town. There's two to three of us per town. Um, we kind of operate similarly to um, other municipal districts like um, solid waste or consolidated water. Um, and as board members, we just sort of oversee uh, the financing and the uh, building um, of the, the network to be. Um, and I do want to take a moment to um, acknowledge all the work that Leah did for us in getting the uh, CUD uh, off the ground in the oil and uh, all the work she did to, in kind of our first year of operation, uh, getting us up and running, managing meetings, all that stuff. Um, I still remember seeing her present about the CUD right here a couple of years ago and um, all the work she did with the Elson PC to get that off the ground. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to be part of. So here we are now. Um, so a little bit about what we do specifically. Um, we're all about providing a service. Um, we're currently serving across all our member towns about 23,000 people. Um, with locations, um, addresses we want to serve, we're about 500 road miles. We use uh, roads as a metric just because um, fibers run along utility poles, which typically follow roads. Um, so that's what we're using that measure. Um, we do a lot of collaboration with different groups, uh, select boards, uh, North uh, Planning Commission, um, uh, and the Department of Public Service and two organizations which are very CUD specific. So there's BCUDA, which is the association of all the Vermont CDs, um, where they all collaborate. And also the newly created Vermont Community Broadband Board, which was set up recently by the state to um, sort of uh, uh, disperse all the um, any federal funding that comes in for broadband and also to just kind of keep an eye on the CDs, uh, make sure we're allocating resources in a way that isn't redundant and so on. Um, so that's what they're doing. Um, and then finance is some tech call in here. <laughs> I don't know why. I <laughs> the right line. For me, I think it was to finance. But um, this slide shows our general uh, operating plan with regard to finance. And so the idea is that we start with grants, we build some infrastructure, we start to serve a small community. You borrow some money based on those uh, hard assets, extend the network further, try to develop a sound financial model, use that uh, ammunition then to go to the bond market and uh, raise money. Um, this all may change depending on who we partner with, what they bring to the table, but this is sort of the general operating framework that we, that we see is progressing. 
So what have we done so far? Um, as Charlotte said, Steve V is a municipality. We're basically a town uh, without many people. And so we need policies, we need procedures, we need legal advice, we need insurance, we need all that crap you guys deal with. And it's been an astounding amount of work to get it going at the start, um, of which Leo was a huge part of. So uh, outside of all that, um, we have uh, done a feasibility study and, and subsequent steps was led to a business plan. We then took that business plan to a third party consultant to say, what do you think? You know, we are our minds here. Um, and we started collecting all data and, and so forth. So we're well underway to um, progressing on this. Currently, uh, I'm going to jump to the bottom of the slide first. The most important thing we've done recently is hire a new executive director. I'm happy to say he's sitting right next to me, Val Davis. Uh, Val was with the uh, co op for years as an IT specialist, worked with Christine Hulk, as close to the was there, and is very familiar with the types of challenges we're going to be facing with respect to network building. Um, so we are very appreciative and glad to have you with Val. Um, jumping back up to the top for a second, uh, well, second bullet actually, we issued an RFP request for proposal to ISP providers. We got a bunch of responses, and our partnership task force, which is a subgroup of the covering board, has been working really hard on going through those, whittling it down, throwing people out, um, conducting interviews, and, and it's now down to a core of three uh, pretty promising uh, operators. And, so that's, that's the, the heavy lifting that's going on right now. That's the big effort because the next big decision is going to be we're going to work with how this is actually going to fly. Um, we're also doing a lot of transitioning. Uh, now is working hard in getting all of our information that we have in our GIS so that it's all mapped out and we can keep track of all the data we have and so forth. Um, next steps. Like I said, the big one is uh, choosing an ISP. Uh, once we've done that, then we go back to that high level design we have, refine it, uh, and then we go to uh, BCBD for funding. Uh, as Charles said, they are going to be the state's warehouse for the federal dollars that companies so essentially apply for a grant. We just we're applying to them for that money and go oversee it. Uh, we do have enough money to, uh, we think, survive until then. So that's good. Um, what I want to uh, focus on this slide, this slide is it's interesting that you know we've got this great opportunity to build something several dollars. Problem is, there's several dollars going everywhere right now for the same damn thing. So everybody's competing for you know trying to buy fire, trying to buy equipment, trying to hire people, trying to get construction folks out. Um, so it's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good, but there's still some definite hurdles that we're going to be looking at uh, overcoming. Meanwhile, until we start building, we're also competing with other providers who are already on the ground. Um, so we've got some catching up to do as well. Uh, nothing about too much about ARPA, um, other than to say, A, we're not here to ask for money tonight. Um, I'm glad to be here. But we are here to say that if you do decide to uh, invest some of the ARPA funds in broadband, we request that you talk to the one fiber net first. Um, it's locally controlled. Um, we have benefits being not for profit, so we're providing uh, these services at lower cost than a for profit provider would be able to do. And you know, our idea is to serve every single address here. So we're just going to try to bring that digital divide that currently exists between the non rated areas in the more rural. That's it. Um, now, have you, seen, have you seen a couple words? Or sure. I, I, I want to point out that it's where we're looking for partners. One of our uh, uh, requirements is that whoever we partner with be committed to universal access, getting service to everybody. Uh, there are a lot of uh, providers out there who are very focused on the population centers so that they can spend a little and gain a lot. Uh, but we need to build out a network that goes everywhere. So whoever we partner with is going to be committed to going to the to the last mile to the end of the road to, to get everybody online, and that's that's a part of our core mission. That has to be the outcome when we're done. 
So we're not just going to be bringing it to, to people who are easy to reach, but to every single, <laughs> at the end of the road, they'll have fire, which is pretty remarkable. And it's a huge undertaking. Uh, we're, we're going back for a, a, another level of design work uh, to, to detail and flush out uh, what has to be done. And then we choose a partner based on their willingness to, to commit to our mission. And uh, hopefully we're going to have that wrapped up here before the end of the year. <laughs> then you look at all. Before the end of the month would be great, but by the end of December it would be wonderful as well. So that's where we're at. It's very much like the rural electrification program back in the day, where that was before it was just trying to get all that in the road is, is interesting. I also like to say that I am blown away by the breadth and depth of expertise that we have on our board at uh, Memorial Fiber CD. Uh, we've got uh, people who were involved with building the first fiber network in Vermont, the sovereign net that became. First layer. First layer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got people who've been involved in technology for 30, 40 years. I mean, it's just amazing who's on the board and uh, the expertise that's there. And now uh, we have a lot of expertise at the state level as well with the BCBB. Uh, Christine, as you know, has a, a remarkable background with the utilities and is very well respected and knows her stuff. So we have that in our back pocket to work with us as well. So we're, we're, we're excited about what we're doing. Who's the health business chair or the director of the- She's the executive director of the Vermont Community Broadband Communications. Okay. Thank you, Matt. A couple of questions. Um, you talked about public financing funding. Would our municipal loan fund for town or would municipal loan fund be um, helpful? The Any money that we can bring in is helpful, yes. We're looking at uh, the, the federal grants covering somewhere between 40 and 60% of the build out right now. Uh -huh. And uh, we're going to have to cover that other uh, percentage. The current structure is that we'll take the initial monies to build to the areas we can get to that have population density where we can begin providing service and that the revenues from those services will then slowly uh, over the next, you know, three to seven years, allow us to continue to build that. The more money we have up front, the, the more we can reach initially. So, any and all, uh, anybody who wants to donate, donate is welcome. <laughs> well, that's not a donation. That's a, that's a loan. That's a loan fund that we have in this house. Oh, okay, we, wonderful. So we should probably talk more about that. Um, but that's yeah, that's that 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 could absolutely fit in at some point in the project. Yeah. But the other thing I'm wondering is if we were to use some of our federal dollars that we're getting from, from um, and we wanted to spend it on this, would we, would we do so through the, the bond process that you described, or would, we, would it be a donation? Uh, uh, it would be uh, donations on the right word, but uh, allocation to you. Any bond process we do is, is going to have a payback to it. Right. Uh, so uh, the allocations through ARPA funds would be grants. Okay. All right. Uh, the, the only other last question I have: Do you, do you anticipate other municipalities, other towns? Is it Elmore's not in? Do you feel like more towns should join? Is it or are we at a good size? Well, we're at a good size, and uh, other towns may be joining. There are discussions going on. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it's a good thing or not. It is a good thing that because the more at, the more addresses we have, the more federal dollars come to us, the more uh, potential customer base we have to to yeah. operate the system. So you don't have a fear of getting too big. No, no. I mean, it also makes it more attractive to the ISPs. Right. We're right. actually so, one of the smallest CDs. Right. Kind of Northeast Kingdom Broadway, I think it was. Two or three times our size? Oh, at least, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think there are yep. 29 towns. Mm -hmm. uh, Northeast Kingdom Broadband is the largest in the state. Yeah. What's your point to do on that? There is there's a dynamic of bringing towns up to more rural addresses, and you've got even more road mileage to cover. So there is, there is two sides to the point. Right. Our, our kind of philosophy is the bigger we are, the better. Right. And our, 
all of the CUDs over, uh, overarching goals is to make sure that every address in Vermont gets connected. Yeah. So we can't be doing what the for-profit IXPs are and right. picking and choosing. Right. Yeah, that's something we sort of glossed over, sorry. We, one of our intentions is to work with the current commercial ISP providers to help them extend out to where they wouldn't go otherwise. So yeah, as long as we can get them to commit to the universal access, mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. enter into an agreement with, with existing providers and we can be a, a, a channel for federal dollars to them. They can't get to those federal dollars on their own. They have to go through the CDs, um, yeah. but they have to be willing to make that commitment. And that's that's a sticking point for some of them. Will there be clawback provisions in any of the contracts you sign with these ISPs that allow us to, if they make a commitment up front that they then renege on down the road, that allow us to get some of that money back? They're not going to be putting money in. Uh, we're, <clears throat> the money that we're spending is to build the network. That's the great thing here. When we're done, we own the network. If an ISP pulls or, or fails, we can either spin up and become an ISP on our own and we have infrastructure in place then to then provide service, or we can find another interested ISP to come in and pick up and begin providing service. Okay, great. But the idea is to choose a provider that is not <laughs> gonna, that, you know, that's that's the partnership tax force job is to, to pick the right one that has the, longevity, the expertise, the backing, so that we don't have to worry about them collapsing underneath us. Right. Thank you. Beth, you ready? Any questions? Uh, one Kennedy? Question? I don't, it doesn't appear so. Okay. Well, uh, just no further questions from anyone in public. Thank you for your presentation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we all get an email from Sophia that they will not be here tonight to the Immigration Justice Committee to your activities. So, any questions? We will discuss it. Any questions? Just the one thing to mention is that the training segment plan that got canceled or arranged for January, February timeframe. Uh, I can just briefly run through what we from her the report that Sophie gave us. One yeah, second to fix the, the camera. I have it. Want me to just read it? Sure. Um, so Shane Spence and Ophi Warson will both attend, they both attended the last uh, RJC meeting. Shane brought forth the fundraising opportunity for the RC to, uh, RJC to sell t-shirts with the Johnson inclusivity statement printed on them. The idea was to unanimously supported and all three proceeds were an effort of the Justice Committee. The RJC has unanimously voted to reschedule the implicit bias and bystander training workshops for the Human Rights Commission for January or February 2022, giving us time to incorporate new, member, new members and divide tasks appropriately. Uh, we have also extended the deadline for the written expression contest to December 1st to allow for optimal student participation. Raven and Sophia attended a meeting at the Alchemist, uh, which is a local business committed to engaging with our community and using their platform to further racial justice, in which they brought together members of, and leaders from local justice groups in the area to listen, learn, and connect for our individual and joint efforts in the state and our communities. It was an inspiring group to be with, and we look forward to further uh, for furthering these connections. We look forward to the appointment of the members of the RTC. Thank you, Beth. Is there any comments from board members? Board public? Okay. Brian, do you want to do your report from there? Yeah, if that's all right. Um, so first up, plan purchases. Uh, we have, you got that today. Uh, there are First item is uh, winter tires for the uh, Ram 3500. 
see it, that on that it is listed as $3,500. It is, should not be $3,500. It will be uh, between, um, an estimated between 1,000 and uh, 1,400. Um, but 3,500 is the model number of the truck. Oh, yeah. Uh, the second item uh, up for discussion is sealing on the um, uh, the salt shed. So we've got a problem right now with water infiltrating around the blocks that make up the sides of the salt shed. I'm not sure if everybody has a good image of what the salt shed looks like, but it, it's waste blocks on two sides and a. Uh, scaffolding and stretched material, stretched plastic cover over the top of it. Um, we're having water infiltrating in between the waste blocks. The, the, they're big concrete blocks. They're not mortared in place or anything. They're just laid in place. Uh, and so water's getting in and we're wasting salt that way. Um, Is that no problem? I think that it's, exacerbated. I think it's gotten worse, but I don't think it's new. I think it was something that is probably always inherent uh, in a structure like that, but um, you know, it seems it seems like it's gotten worse, or maybe we didn't pay close enough attention to it earlier, but uh, without, it, without it being sealed, this was, there was definitely always the capacity for water to get it. Um, so uh, we were interested in getting uh, in doing some kind of sealant for it. We've received one quote for $3,500 to use uh, a roofing material or a roofing strategy of using that kind of sealing material over the waste blocks. What's the seven thousand? Uh, that's the total of the items that we had listed. Uh, uh, there was a request okay. for a running total of, of all the expenditures. Oh, okay, so it was off from the salt shed. So yeah. So we've only had one. We only have had one quote returned this time. So basically, you're looking for guns from the board. On do we want to take that or put it out for a bid? We don't necessarily. I can do. I can try and get some other. I can request a couple other quotes uh, and come in. I guess my advice for this would be to. Uh, for the board to approve it for $3,500 or less. Uh, I'll go out and I'll see if that I can accomplish the same thing for less money. Uh, but I know that this company has an opening in their schedule. <coughs> and the total amount spent doesn't require us to go up, doesn't require a whole RFP sealed bid process. It, it just, uh, and it, it, it does not require multiple bids, but it's, Kind of, that's enough money that it's good practice. It specifically says in our policy, although not required, competitive quotes from at least two vendors should be obtained whenever possible. Right. And at this time, we have not been able to, but I wouldn't say that we've exhausted all possibilities of, you know, we might be able to get another one. So, I'll make a motion. I make a motion. We can talk about it in a second and you can turn it down. It's fine. But I make a motion to approve um, the salt shed sealant, whatever that ends up meaning, <laughs> for up to $3,500 um, with uh, also looking for an additional quote, at least one more quote um, to be awarded for the best price and delivery. Okay, we have a motion with a second. Prices to thirty five hundred and getting a second quote for it. And getting a second quote. So purchase up to thirty five hundred and get a second quote. Which means that whichever quote comes in, we're going to leave it up to Brian Jason's discretion on who they select, as long as it's thirty five hundred or less. Yes. For the sake of discussion, I'll second. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Open up for discussion. Do you like this approach of like an open membrane with a couple of 
live zombie or do you want to go to some sort of a spray installation? I know it might be more, but it might be a little bit better on equipment. I guess I'm asking for your opinion. This all got brought up and we reached out this uh, spring so I can put that one mark so we'll put in the woodhouse and try to come on board figure out what we want to do. I think there might be a couple options. Uh, Ryan must try to be talking about paint some a membrane or plastic on that media up under that plastic, bring it down so it sheds the water out that way. I had we wanted to reach out to five. That was, that was a couple months ago. This guy found an email back this week saying he had a way to take the tunnel and do it next week. He and Brian talked about it, and we were going to do our investigation and see what the best fit for this ceiling and blocks would be. Well, because we're in discussion, I like that idea better. I think it's a problem that needs to be dealt with. And I mean, I was down there and saw it and I said, this can't stay like this, but I don't know. Nine calm solutions really on the lake. And if you guys want to try something else, look at it. You know it's a memory. I don't like it at all. It's going to be too weak. I mean, sometimes the sand pile up the pit, you can scrape a little bit more like that. I don't know if we're going to spend $3,500 again. I'd rather see tire spray on it for. That's the only thing I'm concerned about with the membrane is because we're very within three feet proximity of the equipment in the winter and stuff, but we could have potential of damage on that one side, so that would be plus if if you guys want to try something different, see if it works for you or something. That might be a good approach is to try your thoughts <laughs> the water away for a year. If it doesn't work, then you can always go back to the I guess I'm of the opinion it needs to be fixed, but maybe this isn't the best fit for the town. If you guys have some other ideas, well, maybe next meeting. I don't want to keep pushing this down the road. This snow is going to be here tomorrow. But. If, if I can offer a <laughs> suggestion, I think the motion on the floor gives us the ability to do something else. It's we have a cap on the most money we can spend on this right now, uh, but if we spend less, we're we're okay. And I think I would also interpret that as if we have a better option that we can't accomplish in that budget, that we would also come back to the board and say, like, hey, look, you know, it's going to cost us five thousand dollars, but we're really confident that this is going to last a long time and be a really good solution. Uh, I'm quite comfortable with the motion as it stands and giving us the freedom to. And you're hearing the interests of the board to try maybe these other methods. If, if yeah. It turns out to be feasible. Yeah, I, I'm quite comfortable with that we have what we need to come up with the best solution uh, for the problem. Mike, do you have any comments? Uh, I'd still like a couple of bids up front. That's sort of what our motion is asking for. Um, and also- not, not really, it's, uh, you're gonna go with that if there's nothing else, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't like that kind of a deal. We're also, uh, there's some ideas that Jason and the crew have on how maybe to shed the water away without doing this membrane. So we're going to explore all of them. Okay, well, explore those first before we agree to thirty-five hundred. So that's that's the, the takeaway. They're going to take our our uh, motion was made in a way that doesn't lock us into hiring that bidder. They can uh, use their best judgments, and if they feel that they can do this with uh, their uh, the way they're thinking about, they might be able to. Then they won't go. They won't spend the money on the bid. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I mean, I, I, if you if you guys don't want to, whatever, however you want to go on the motion, it won't hurt my feelings any. I just figured that we give them a, the authority to thirty four over there. If we give the freedom to up to thirty five hundred, and it can 
create a solution for protecting the salt in some way because we know it's a problem, then why not? That's kind of my thinking around it. So before I call the vote, and this is not unheard of, are you going to vote against your own motion? No. Okay. Because she will mock you. For <laughs> I mean, I don't care. <laughs> Not that anybody's ever done that. I before. might someday, but not today. Any further discussion? I can get more information and you can come up with the ideas and have a break for the next meeting. That can be for everybody. I think it's pretty easy. Well, I don't know if those are friendly amendments, but or I don't think it needs one. Pass is approved for up to $3,500 for what you want. They think it's right. Yes, we got that. Board prepared to vote. All those, actually, I'll, I'll just start right off the roll call because we have one on Zoom. Jeff, how do you vote? Hi. Mike, how do you vote? Nay. Matt, how do you vote? Hi. Evan, how do you vote? Hi. Guys, have it. The motion passes. Okay. Uh, Racial Justice Committee appointments. We got two candidates, Shane and Hoppy. Oh, we got a question. I think we're good with the Pullman Tires. Well, it's in all the uh, we, 500. That'd be around 1,400, you said. I, I'm expecting, I did a little bit of quick research and I saw 250 to 350 per, per tire. So, you need tires for a while, right? Is that in the motion? Or tires? That's in general. Yeah. We're still kind of figuring out exactly how we handle the purchases when we review them, but it was over a thousand. That's why, right? Yeah. Well, it's over a thousand, which and our thing says with with select board approval. So right, it does say approval. So I think that needs a motion. Okay, so I'll look for a motion authorizing uh, Jason to purchase some tires for the Dodge Ram thirty five hundred. Some old. Are you going to put a dollar amount on that? <coughs> Not to exceed 1500 1500 Is that six tires for that? Is it six or four? It's six. It's yeah. six. So well, I'm wrong on that. I'm thinking. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering. I'm not to 250 a tire. Yeah. So we'll think 250 to 350 per tire. Not to exceed 2000 that would be something like a good work because the mountain balance and stuff. Who else? That's your motion? Yep. We have a motion authorizing purchase of Dodge Ram 3500 tires, not to exceed 2000. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Mike, did you hear the motion? Any discussion? Yes, just barely. Motion. Uh, the C2000 for tires for the 3500. You have anything you want to add? If not, okay, we'll do a roll call. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. Mike, how do you vote? Aye. Matt, how do you vote? Aye. Evan, how do you vote? Aye. You always have it. Motion passes. Okay, we have two candidates, Shane and Offy, both here tonight for the Racial Justice Committee. We both have got their letters of interest. What's the board's pleasure? Do you want to uh, have them both introduce themselves, say a few words, and open it up for questions? Please. Can I say something first? Uh, I think it's supposed to be like six people on the commission. That mm -hmm. you allow yes. It's five now. Yes. You have the power, I believe, to. Um, well, with a, only if you elect one person, you'll have an even number. You know, not good for tie ropes. You have the power here to extend the commission before we review anybody to maybe accept two candidates. I mean, to add two people. Yep. You can do that, up to you. And uh, since um, if you were to do that, and there's two people here that are interested, and if you find those two people qualify, then that would be, um, and you would have a board, and you would have a commission that has an uneven number, which is good for breaking ties. That's all. You bring up a good point. It's the same thing that I brought up uh, 
our last meeting where if we left it at five, hmm. it would be the same uh, scenario. Uh, and the reason we got to six is because the way it originally was set, uh, three appointments from the town, three from the village. That's historically how it got set. Um, I think you bring up a, a very good point and it was one I brought up. And I guess I'll put it right out to the board first before we even start, what are the board members' thoughts? If we did increase it to seven, it'd be a real easy choice for us tonight. Sounds like a good idea to me. I like an odd number. Typically our committees are odd numbers. We have six now? Yeah, we're at six. This will put it up to seven, or if we left it the way it is, it's five. Do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I have thoughts running through my mind, but I'm not ready to share it yet. Sophia, Eric, Raven, Raven, Shane, do you have any thoughts on what just I I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, as as I mentioned, that I think this is the only committee that exists in town that is an even number. Um, had a reason for that at the inception, but not so much anymore. Um, you know, I, I have gotten Mel off pretty well over the years, so if he's the one who gets it, then I won't necessarily complain. I think he's uh, got a lot to offer, um, but it would probably be an easier decision if you match to choose between the two of us. And, and I also talked about this with him on the phone yesterday. It's the same thing. Okay. And the Senate was going to say this, and when you go along with it, you're expanding the board, and then um, the Senate. And then uh, if you can, both of us qualify, then <coughs> you'd be on the board. Oh, it's, a, it's an interesting proposal. Um, and I'm going to put that question before the board first, because obviously that would uh, change our process. Sir, can you repeat this one more question? Eric Quiltz? I didn't hear your whole list. That's the odd that I I don't really like the idea of a two tonight. Okay. Articulate reason. Uh, I have a lot of reasons. Actually, I have a, well, I have a couple of different reasons. One is. Um, I need that to help persuade me one way or the other. Well, yeah, if we're going to talk about, we start talking about equities and equalities and things like that, um, this probably won't be a very well received vote by many, but I'd prefer to see not a shift in male to female ratio, for one reason. Um, and also, we've gone back and forth to the racial justice committee asking for nominees and if we feel that you know we're making the decision on who to nominate and when that time comes on the fly we decided to change the membership number i just don't think that's fair It's one of those things like, is this a bias thing where it's just easier for us? And that's the rationale that is allowing us to justify it. I feel like that would be my justification. And that's not a good reason. <laughs> There's two good candidates here. Sure. Or do you want to stay at five? And that way we would 
And I feel like that's an out. And I think that having six people on a committee is not a bad thing because we have a chair. And, you know, if depending on how you fill your role as chair, chairs are often tiebreakers. Um, and if there aren't ties, then I don't know. No, I would like to appoint somebody tonight, a single person tonight. That's just my opinion. Okay, let me do a, uh, a straw vote here. If one person would like to stick to what the original plan was. And then, your thoughts? You know that saying. I personally like to vote. <coughs> she brings up that one. One of the is that. We didn't warn a decision on changing the number of people. We warned a decision on making a, a nominating appointment. Sorry, Kevin. Yeah. Official Justice Committee appointments. <laughs> well, I feel like that's a technicality. <laughs> I don't have a strong feeling about it. Mike, do you have a, a strong preference one way or the other? Did what did Beth say? I, you know, half the time I can't hear anybody out there, and it's kind of <laughs> annoying. And you know, <laughs> I may sign <laughs> off here shortly because you know I can't hear hardly a thing. Uh, what what was did was something said about this was technically only worn for one position? Did somebody say that? Yes, I said this was warned for an appointment. It wasn't warned that we we're changing the number of people on the committee. That's true. In that case, I nominate Afi Worthman to the Racial Justice Committee. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second to nominate Afi Worthman. Open up for any discussion. I make a second nomination. Yep, make a second nomination. If I make a second nomination, is it? Then we'll vote for both. We'll take the vote on each. Yeah. All right, so you made a motion, right? I seconded it. Second. You seconded it. So there is a motion and a second to nominate Avi the position. Okay. I'm going to move to amend the motion to appoint both. Okay, there is a, a motion to amend the motion to appoint both candidates. Is there a second? Did you hear that, Mike? Yes, I did. I, but that's. I'm not going to agree to that. Okay. There's a second. Lacking a second, the motion will fail. The motion has failed to amend. So we're back to the original motion of appointing Hoppy. Is there any more discussion? Be done. We'll do a roll call vote. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. Mike, how do you vote? Aye. Nat, how do you vote? Aye. Evan, how do you vote? Aye. The eyes have it. Congratulations, Offer. You're on the committee. Thank you. Long way to get around there, but you did it. I would have liked it better if you had both of us on. Really? Well, Things are committed. I, I know. Appreciate that. Sure. <coughs> we appreciate your passion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for coming here tonight. Scrivener Bridge maintenance planning. All right. So, one of your supplements, you've got a one page supplement with the town administrator letterhead at the top. Um, we had a couple of discussions with the board a while ago about Scrivener Bridge and uh, that we were going to pursue 
we had done the, the road repair work in front of it, but and we were still going to be pursuing some additional work on the bridge itself, in particular a scoping study uh, to help with the uh, kind of what's our maintenance plan in the, uh, in the future and in the near term. Um, that the first avenue that we have for obtaining funding for that uh, study for the maintenance plan is up, and that's through the Transportation Alternatives Program. Um, LCPC is assisting us with uh, obtaining the grant, uh, which is good. It's a Transportation Alternatives Program. It's a pretty complicated program, so I really appreciate Rob's assistance with this and also uh, preparing the uh, similar applications to a couple other programs that uh, will also be eligible. So it's a yeah. kind of long one pager. Um, so uh, what we need is the board's continued support and uh, the probably would be best for the chair's authorization to sign the letter. Okay, what's the board's pleasure? Or do you want to ask the questions first? This is just for applying. It is just for applying for the grant, but this will commit us to spending public funds by how much? We don't have the scoping study is going to tell us how much maintenance is going to cost. Rob, do you have any estimate on what the scoping study will cost? I have reached out to uh, uh, the consultants to get a ballpark on that. Um, my gut is saying that the two primary issues uh, related to that bridge are the uh, low water crossing, the, the flood mitigation efforts, and the structural condition of the timber um, structure itself. So because of those two issues, my instinct is telling me it would be more around the range of thirty to $50,000 for a scope and study to analyze that. The HC transportation grant program that would cover that study pays 80% of the total cost. I'm be responsible for 20% of my best guess at this time is thirty to fifty thousand dollars. I can't confirm that. Yeah. It's possible that it's less. I think it's unlikely that it's more. If you have a scoping study with only one issue, and it's a relatively straightforward single issue, scoping studies can be around $20,000, maybe $30,000. But this is two issues. So you're looking at outer limits probably to the town out of pocket would be $10,000. Outer limits, that's my best guess. Best guess. And that's well within what we have in our uh, bridge reserve fund. Yeah. Which is, this would be eligible for. Yeah, th this is 100% in the wheelhouse of our, this is why we have a bridge reserve fund. If I may, yes, go ahead. Um, for what it's worth, um, we strategized on the approach to this, um, finding funding to study the issue which would then allow us to move forward with construction, which is the real goal. So let's fix the bridge and fix the road right next to the bridge. Um, there are some other possibilities. There's a few uh, FEMA or Vermont emergency management related grant funding programs that would be potential funders for both the study and construction. Navigating those, uh, working with that program has some limitations in um, that one being the, uh, I need to come up with a better way to explain this, I'm sorry. It, it, there's, there's a sort of a, a, a complementary relationship between uh, uh, the funding of a study for the engineer and the uh, construction. And with VTRAN's federal highway money, which would ultimately fund the construction, you are required to have your scoping study already in hand. And that must follow a very prescriptive procedure for scoping studies according to federal highway rules. 
if the scoping study therefore was funded by say emergency management and then we needed in the future to get construction funding from the transportation folks it's very likely that they say oh no we have to go back and redo your engineering so none of us want to do that this approach that putting putting the engineering study up front paid for by federal highway funding would allow the most doors open to remain open as possible in the future for construction. So if we get the VTrans study, then we could ultimately decide to get construction funding from another agency, for example, or just Mike, just turned off. Oh, okay. That was our um, best uh, strategic recommendation given the timeline and the urgency to let's get something happening on the ground. Um, leaves the most doors open uh, for us to identify what's the fastest way possible to get construction approvals and construction funding. That's the recommendation from LCP. We just need consensus to make a motion. We need a motion. Okay, a motion to um, approve the transportation alternate grant program scoping study. Uh, does that sound sufficient enough? Uh, maybe something about having the board sign the letter. Uh, and allowing Eric to sign the letter on behalf of the board. Thank you. That's what I have. Motion. I don't think it's the word proceed. You got the word proceed. Proceed with that. Sorry, proceed with the uh, 2022 Transportation Alternatives Grant Program for Scoping Study of Scripner Bridge um, and giving Eric authorization to sign on behalf of the board. Motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Do you want to put a limit on that? I mean, we. It would still need to come back to us. Yeah, the, the, this is a yes, yeah, this would be authorized. This is the application public resources. Now. Yeah, but the application. Where are we spending public resources? Because I asked how much and I get a. You, you get a right. We don't know, and there will be an opportunity. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, yes. And there. Oh, sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, you will have another opportunity to discuss this when, assuming that the grant is awarded, um, it will require the town's signature and form of a contract. And at that time, you can deny the award if you so choose. It will have a better number. You'll have a firm number yeah. at that point of what it's going to cost. So we would have a number then the next time. This just allows you to. Continue the process. Submit the application and request to be allocated for Johnson. More comfortable? Put it <laughs> Any other discussion? You mind and Mike has left the, the Zoom meeting? Yes, he has. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Guys, yeah, have it. Thank you guys for sticking through all night. Or at this point, thank you. Welcome to stay. Thank you very much. And I want to take the opportunity to introduce Sal, as uh, my colleague at One Point Planning. Welcome aboard. Been instrumental in helping put together the, the application itself. So, uh, Sal's been a great help. And I believe we have uh, one more item. We do. Okay. Uh, so, your next supplement uh, at the top of the tree is an FY22 municipal resolution for municipal planning grant. So this is a, uh, I believe it's a county-wide study uh, that LCPC is leading in kind of the barriers between uh, folks that want to provide child care. So it looks at the lack of child care in general, but it's specifically about what can we do to support child care providers. It started as a, a study on uh, municipal infrastructure of Water and sewer, I think, was the, the initial thought that they were going with it. And they've, they're since kind of expanding out to uh, more about barriers with the still with an emphasis on infrastructure. Okay, so what are you looking for from us tonight? Is a motion to be party to it? So, um, 
We are looking for the Town of Johnson and Florida Consortium of Cambridge um, will fit uh, and potentially so. And I like to put out that there is no municipal, municipality match required at all. If the match is coming from the Memorial Family Center. And essentially what your role would be is to, to review our findings, to act as like a checks and balances, and ask questions when you have them and we'll give back answers. Um, like, uh, like Brian said, we're looking to figure out what type of barriers are preventing childcare from having a real total in Memorial County. Um, that could be infrastructure, that could be, um, maybe you could say like socioeconomic reasons. Um, it could be a plethora of things, and that's what the study is going to go for. I know it might not be, it might sound a little bit vague, um, but that's because not many studies like this have been conducted in the past. So we would, this, this would, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but it would help shed light on a very unknown topic. And we would just greatly appreciate it if you could be a part of that. Okay. I would entertain a motion to adopt this resolution if the court so desires. A we have motion, we have second. Second. We have motion, second, any discussion? So, just for clarity, this is, sorry, I. I was thinking well, probably a little bit more than I should have been listening, <laughs> but this is a grant to fund the study. Um, so we are going to be applying for a grant to fund the study, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank Thank you. No funding needed from the town. Yeah, no yeah I, I got that part. I got that part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's always a good use. That part of here. Any <laughs> further discussion? Being done, all those favors signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed, congratulations. Thank and again, you. thank you for staying through it all. Thank you, you all for your like time. Watching the paint dry. Looking forward to working with you. <laughs> the childcare thing is huge, so we can all Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 it's tough to find. I think I know how Sal explained it, but it is. We all have these anecdotal uh, knowledge of mm -hmm. how hard it is to find childcare. Yeah. And this is going to actually document that kind of stuff, hopefully with some proposed solutions or at least a brainstorming on how to yep. solve that puzzle. So uh, we're not going to leave all the world's problems overnight, but um, we're, we're trying to point in that direction. How can we wrap our heads around this one and make progress to get a foothold of child care? Uh, Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Very well. Thanks, Rob. Okay, the memorandum of understanding. This is, and I believe the library is Jessica's already plus plus. Jasmine, you're on. Jasmine. Okay. And this, the only real change here from the last time you saw it was the procurement policy mm -hmm. hadn't been adopted. And so it was felt that we shouldn't adopt this until the procurement policy had been sorted out. So, so the only real firm change is that we now state that on page two of the building maintenance, the trustee shall be responsible for all our internal items and day to day maintenance, including such things. As light bulb changing, trash removal, small plumbing projects, i.e., clogs and toilet, or projects under $1,000, and within an allocated annual budget. So we just made that in line with the procurement policy. So that's the reason. I really hate to do this. I'm sorry, Jessica. <laughs> but what I would like to say instead of $1,000 is call it the just minor purchases? Yes, thank you. We can throw a little bit change. That that way, if we change the procurement policy, it automatically changes here. Yeah. Yes, so that way it doesn't have to go back to the trustees. But yep. it's that minor purchase level. So, yeah, it would be good for that. Yes, so, yeah, absolutely. And then I guess the other piece is just seeing you know, who should be listed for the town signature lines. Um, you know, getting that information on the actual document, you know, so who is the, the select board designee, you know, I would assume that um, Gary is a director, and the director is a, also a designee for an emergency team member, management team member, and then 
Who are those people? On that page. Okay. Oh, if a team was to be developed, well, it's more uh, contacts. Con yeah, the kind of regular oh. contacts. Okay. Um, so it would, you know, they're requesting to. This isn't people who are signing it. It's just people who are listed as contacts in here. Uh, it would be the EMD, somebody else that they might reach out to during mm -hmm. emergencies. Yep, yep, and that would be taken care of. Yeah, and uh, somebody from the select board. Um, I actually feel like for the same reason in reference to procurement, like Brian, your name shouldn't be there. It should be town administrator and a member. Um, just in case, you know. I think we're gonna update this annually. So it was the plan, and so, like even you know thinking of you know I think you know right now we have myself as the trustee chair, and that's through the next you know cycle of election each year after um, after town meeting we look at who the officers are on the trustee board. So so and then I think it actually says in here that the meeting after we'll bring it back. The new MOU back with any updates. So, in that sense, it actually is a name of a person. But, you know, if we need to go position, that's fine too. But, but maybe we could have a compromise and do the position first on the list. I mean, if the name's going to be good, then I don't really care. Yeah. I'm just thinking that if we're to have. You never have to worry to about have changing it if the yeah. title is there, not the name, um, because of personnel change. Page before the tree. Yeah. yeah. And they could do the same thing. They could do the same. Yeah. We, we will just have our, our contact info there, which we need to change if we change. Yeah. So, so for that reason, I think it's good to have a name there. So you have the name with contact information. So you're trying to call that person. So. But actually, all of this information should be in our yeah. emergency management. Emergency management. We have to do that annually, anyhow. Oh, and if this memorandum was kept just to the titles, then we never have to do a new one unless we get some yeah, changes. Contact list every year. Yeah. I mean, the contact list is maintained in the. Uh, for, the but I don't know that we as library trustees necessarily have a copy of the emergency. You can. So that would be yep. something to rectify. So that we have and we have everybody in the town, village, all contacts. So that, that's actually a good document. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. No, that should be referenced here. Like, I feel like instead of having designated contacts listed, right. that reference to the emergency management document should be listed because that's always going to be have to be updated annually. And that's where you find your library chair, your facilities liaison, your library director, you know, each of the roles. Yeah, you're, you're actually, that's a good point. But... You know, I don't think that it gets, I know Gene is listed in our emergency management plan. I'm not sure if even Jessica is listed in the emergency management plan or not. But we could. We could. Yeah. And we had talked about developing a more expansive contact list that just the can, minimum necessary. Can we look at that and see if at least Jessica's listed? Yeah. We know yeah. all the rest of us are listed. And facilities liaison, I would think would be a really big one. <laughs> it's emergency management. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to review this. And hopefully March anyway. So yeah. let's Let's approve until March. Approve this as is. I think it's already going to be hard to do the dates for inspection. Oh, and yeah. Getting reports back and everything. So I'm just going to point and I'm going to get involved this year because we're already not going to be able to fill it. We tried back in March. I know you did. I'm not one to think of anybody. I mean, we just originally approved it and that made it the updates for two, you know, the emergency management plan and the ATI. But I mean, it started the process of having somebody kind of 
you know, forming the processes of, of and the large reason for this is having that process open communication with somebody that comes and inspects every year. Right? right. And so that way, and ideally the reason we're expecting in you know March or April, really April, is that we can be prepared for November when we're working on our budget. So we've really already started that process. So I mean in that sense, you know, we're not going to be added to the budget, you know, based on that inspection, you know, because that might not even happen until you know, November at some point. Brian, would you be able to sit down and have the emergency management plan on this and see where where this could fit into that? The, you know, as far as the contacts go, and maybe it already is there for some of it. You guys are like staring each other down to see who goes on the list. So I don't think there's anything else that we wanted to add. Um, I, I guess I just have a curious question: Is the emergency management plan like? Could I pull it up on the website now? Is that something no, that's no, public? I'm not sure. Oh, I doubt it is not because it has contact. Yeah, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of personal contact I information. See. It is a public document, but it's okay. But it would be okay if the library sees yes. how yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Important to have just don't call me because I didn't return a book. That would be good. I get those calls. But yeah, I mean the sheriff's department gets the, the contact list, uh, mm -hmm. the whole the whole plan. Uh, fire department. Uh, I'm not sure how this LCPC. Yeah, LCPC. LCPC. State. I don't know if we can spend in state or not. Uh, I believe that, I believe that it is submitted to the state, but that's one thing that LCPC does on our behalf. Uh, so I guess I'm not really sure where it goes at the state, but I know it's everyone who has a role in an emergency situation. They have a copy of it. Who to contact? Reach out. To. So I'll take a look at that. And are we adopting this with changes or do we want to see it again? Um, I offer a motion. You know, like a uh, motion to approve the call the right thing. Memorandum of understanding with the library within the library in town um, with an amendment to the building and maintenance section instead of referencing projects under $1,000. Instead, it will reference projects under the minimum purchase amount for the procurement policy with the intent of updating contact information and reference to emergency plan when in the next review. Okay, we have motion. Second. 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 We'll start. I do think at any point about the inspection maybe you know the committee just speaks up to wait the actual inspections. We may want to provide that motion to say that the while well, this will be signed in, the inspection because we're so close to the next year would be um we waived for the year. We would have been waiting for the year this year because of our budgeting process. Okay. okay. Um, with, with an amendment to waive, I accept that. The inspection. Yeah. That makes so it was yeah. a friendly amendment to your motion. It was agreed by the second group. Are you good, Don? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify to say aye. Uh, those polls. Great job. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Speed little more. Get it in March next year. What's the action you need on this? Uh, the, which one's the other ones? Yeah. So this it would serve as our if we approve it tonight, uh, this would serve as our first step in the approval process of uh, on page for this. On page 15, it details uh, 
and the adoption history and all the steps that we have to go through. So this would serve number one that this is an agenda item on a regular select board meeting held on today's date. If we want to make further changes to it, then the next time it appears will be uh, the first time. But oh, the last time I talked about this, I have recommended legal review. Uh, we had sent it to Roger to ask his opinion on it. Uh, I have not heard back yet from Roger's office. And we're only doing this to make Roger's job easy. Back to us. My recommendation for this, I think that we can benefit a lot by having this uh, beyond just his concerns. Uh, but I still think, I still recommend legal review for any ordinance adoption. That's the kind of thing that could end up in court. So, and it's the Hogback Road Speed Study done. The Hogback Road Speed Study actually is done, and that's another point of discussion that I want to bring up tonight. Um, right now, Hog Bank Road is left off of this list. Uh, I should, sorry, it's not, it should be left off of this list. Uh, or we can add it in with a speed limit of uh, 50 miles an hour. Uh, we did the study in two locations on Hog Bank Road, uh, and the 85th percentile is. Uh, uh, 48 to 49 miles per hour. People are going pretty fast on Hog Bank Road. Say that again. What was your last sentence? Uh, people are going 40, the 85th percentile on Hog Bank Road is 48 and 49 miles per hour. In the section of Johnson? In the, in the Johnson section, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Wow. That's crazy. And we have fast learn to. I, that's why there is some recommendation from the state about, um, you know, that you are probably better served if you put up, if we put up a, a speed limit 50 miles an hour, we put signs for that in that location. We are going to, in effect, people are going to think when they drive down that road, well, it's rated for 50 miles an yeah. hour. And if you're not familiar with the road, it's going 50. Those corners come up on your road. Yeah. Quick. So I actually don't think that we should put up any signs on it right now. Yeah. We don't have the data to do justify lowering the speed limit to 40 miles an hour because the 85th percentile is 48, 49. 48, 49. And there aren't the accidents or anything else there that we can point to to say, you know, the speed that people are driving is unsafe, so we need to lower the limit. Um, we're, we don't really have any grounds to change it, so my recommendation is that we just don't mention it. No, there are going to be a change for the document, anyways. Uh, you're right, I mean, I, I, that's my oversight. There's really no action needed, and I would like Roger to get back to us on his thoughts, especially with they want 42% of the budget. Because it might be nice to have his thoughts on, time. Yeah. on Hogback, too. I mean, we, we have no choice. Yeah. But uh, that's interesting. People are driving that fast. I never would have thought that. In the wintertime, they do. I mean, you leave them in the flat truck on, because they're cutting the corners. Yeah. So it makes I, <clears throat> for a safety concern in the wintertime, I think, but kind of, so they think they can pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would not recommend that we post it for 50 miles an hour. Um, we have the option of just leaving it blank. That means that the speed limit is 50 because that's the, I forget what the term for it is, but that's basically the default. You know, that, that's what an unmarked road is in Vermont. Yeah. So, if we made this for an agenda, or if we accepted it as an agenda item today, we could still take out the hog back before next meeting when we would uh, approve it. 
I don't understand why we would accept this today. It does, that, that is not registered with me. Why would we pass this today if we know we're just going to again next meeting? But we have to, we have to do it twice. Oh, because we have to. That's why. So we're going to accept it today, just as having it on our agenda, and then in our next meeting we could actually approve it, and then it, what it doesn't get adopted for what, sixty days. I think it's sixty days. Because any ordinance, the, the citizen the voters will raise a petition and require a townwide vote on this ordinance. Two years ago, when they were. They went right for the basically, yeah. yeah. There, there's some other things in here. Well, there's one other thing. Uh, uh, Sinclair Road. The speaks of the on Sinclair Road showed that it was marked, the road is marked faster than it should be. So we're lowering the speed limit up from 35 to 25 uh, up to the, the intersection with Rocky Road. So what's the board's pleasure? Do you want to take any action tonight? Or do you want to recognize it being an agenda item? Noted Noted Matt has refused himself. What's your pleasure there? Yeah. Uh. Just reading through the old minutes, I refreshed myself. I just hesitate having blanks. I don't really want to, <laughs> want to sign an ordinance that has nothing listed for a road. I think you I will, I will strike that. We'll remove the hotbed. Just totally reference, remove the reference. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think we can make changes tonight. I. I believe we can do it that way. I think so. We definitely can't after we adopt it. Right. Wait, so I you think you can make changes tonight, but you can't make them after we adopt it. At right. the next meeting, we would not be able to. Because this is an ordinance, not a policy, the process once it's approved. In fact, I believe what comes in at the next meeting, we cannot change it. Right. We can only approve it. So we could change it tonight, but the next time we can't change it, we just have to approve it as it's presented. So we couldn't update how that grow. We could right now. Right now, we aren't. But we're not <laughs> going. So why would we approve it tonight? I'm still not following. I don't understand the logic. All we're doing is recognizing it is on our agenda officially. And then the next meeting is when we officially approve it. But before we approve it, the next meeting, we could make changes. As long as what's posted for the warning for the next meeting. Oh, it's exact. So it we actually can't make changes next meeting. And next okay. Meeting, no. I don't want to make a motion in that case. Okay. I mean, do you want to make a motion? I think I made myself clear earlier. No, you don't want to. I don't either. You want a word back from uh, Roger, right? I mean, last time this came up, I said if I'm making an altar shop, it's here. It's four of us. I'm here two that are not prepared tonight. So it's not that not prepared, it's that like if we're not going to make changes, why would we vote on it tonight when we know there's changes and we don't have all the feedback? That's my you know, my take on it. It's not that I'm not prepared, it's that I mean I kind of am not prepared, but also we don't have all the information. And that, uh, that's what I mean, but we're not prepared. Yeah. Okay, so we'll look at it again. Next one. Uh, next up, the. Yes, yeah, so I was wrong on that. I thought the ATV season had already ended. It actually doesn't end until October 30th, 31st. Um, but the reason it's here is after it has ended, what's the process the board wants to use? Uh, I would suggest, or I could just envision where we would uh, solicit input from the public, the ATV organization, on how did it go? What are their thoughts? 
And then at some point after that, the board would have to decide, do we want to make it permanent or not? If we make it permanent, we're going to have to go into our ATV ordinance, which the ordinance itself should be brushed off anyhow. But realizing we open up that ordinance, more than likely, no matter what we decide to do, a petition can be raised with 5% of the voters, yeah. um, requiring a special townwide meeting, and the voters will actually decide if the ATV ordinance is adopted or not. So I'm just looking for some guidance from this board on how you want to approach this. Do you want to have a dedicated time at one of our meetings in the future where we're and we should probably have a special meeting or special meeting just on the ATV discussion. Which is less than public information. It'd be a public meeting for ATV discussion. You guys try to roll for anybody here. I think that'd be a not a good person. <laughs> well, we're going to want to hear from everybody. But as Mark and Ryan, and Ryan, they all, I mean, you get 90% of the people that are driving ATVs are responsible people that are not doing anything. And you'll always have some people that are going to do the wrong thing. But the early, for the most part, they all look at the tank. They're out going to get away from the car. So I mean, if you see a huge problem with it on the, in the back roads as yeah. far as and that's what we would be looking for is some of that kind of input um, and there's going to be people that are supportive and there's going to be people that are not that uh, you know i've never wanted to turn down an opportunity to hear feedback uh i do think we set a precedent last year when we said you know a group approached us to Change the ordinance and we sent them through the petition process. And I want to be consistent with how we treat people. Mm -hmm. Well, did they get sent through the petition process? Yeah, because of COVID, they didn't have to get the signatures. Right. So the yeah. process, but like, we recognize all, all of the life work for the process. I mean, I watched every one of those meetings. If you guys tried to rewrite what was done and everything, and all of the life work was done for that. They could have done it online. They had they were doing it behind the scenes too. It wasn't just I mean that. I I mean that the that is if we open it up, they could have the opportunity. So I guess what you're saying you don't want to open it up. Depending on feedback. I think there's a difference between getting feedback on the trial this summer. And opening up the ordinance, those are two different things. And I think we should get the feedback from the summer as a trial for a reason. And we should hear what the reaction is. And that's what I'm looking for is, or my thoughts is getting the feedback, but whether or not the ordinance is opened up would be this board's decision. I'll always be looking for feedback on how the trial went. If we believe that the trial went well, then we would go into opening up the ordinance to make it authorizing it. If we feel the uh, trial didn't go well, almost um, we can almost leave the ordinance. It is in place. But if we, it needs to be opened up at some point someday. Why? Just because it's, it's, there's problems with the ordinance. So, I don't know. Some of the things it references and uh, re requiring uh, 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 being registered with the town, and we don't have any registrations, we don't have any. There's some things that should be brushed up. But if the reason that it would need to be opened up, if it were opened up, would be to make the section of Rule 15 a part of it. Right. I swear, I don't know. That's the only thing if there's a change. So how it affected us, right? Because then all of our rooms have always been open. And technically, the group 15 is not being really connected with two sides. We're together. Well, even Railroad Street, because that's a paid yeah. class two road, that was not open. Yeah. But we authorized that one um, in Gould. Gould Hill. So, well, 
presumably the south that it might affect the, our back roads is that by connecting the two sides, we increase traffic. I don't know if that happened or not, but I think that would be good. But anyway, I do feel like you know we uh, we forced it to go to the town meeting vote last year. And that any uh, any change or opening it up, we should treat exactly the same. Way. Hopefully, um, someone approaches us with a petition, with a legal petition that goes on the town meeting ballot. Feedback that way. I mean, I, I, I can imagine that we right, we'll we'll go ahead and we'll have a couple of meetings on feedback. I could probably write the script. I think you could too. You could write the script about what's going to happen at that meeting. We all know what people are going to say. We know what people are going to say. Um, so I don't think we're going to learn anything new. But I do think that we've set up a we've set up a precedent. We sent uh, you know the group last year through the petition process and of course the uh, the town meeting vote. And that if a group approaches us and wants permanent access to Group 15, they should go through that petition process just like we did with the other side, so to speak. But that group um, that was asking for access on Main Street got the count quite vote approval for two years ago. They did. Mm -hmm. So that's already been that's already happened as far as the voters directing the select work in a non-binding we enter mind you, but they did direct the hustle to buy the state. The village, right? And so I guess I, I feel like we've already searched for this. Give the green light to one group and the red light to the other group, and now we're getting the green light to you know we're really putting our finger on the scale here. We just open it up and say, okay, we're going to change the ordinance to allow permanent access to Main Street because we're treating the two sides well. And listen, that's our prerogative as a select board. You know, it's like we're really just favors ATVs on Route 15. See, that's fine, but I think um, I think we really it's uh, out of fairness. We should make them go through the petition process, and they will. That's not going to be all that hard. The way I see it is, we didn't give the green light or the red light to either side. It was the voters who gave the green light and the red light. Well, we gave temporary access to Main Street. That's giving that one side the green light because the voters directed us to. No, we did that on our own. The voters didn't have anything. Yeah. Two years ago, during the town meeting, the voters did a non binding vote. A non binding vote on an unworthy item that came in under other business when there really weren't a lot of voters there. <laughs> it's still a legal vote of the voters. Yeah, I don't think and that. Then, and nobody knew that it was going to be on the agenda. But then last year, it was a balloted item yeah. to restrict ATV use, yeah. and it failed overwhelmingly. Yeah. So the voters sort of have given us their preference on ATV. That's different. No, I would that. Sorry, but last year's vote was very different about extending access to Last year's vote was about repealing the ordinance. That's not the same thing as providing access to Route 15 outside of the tribe. I don't, I can't speak to the binding. I was not at wherever that vote happened. <laughs> maybe that was intentional. Maybe I didn't, didn't know about it to that point. I don't really know. Most people weren't. It wasn't more. It was just all I know. All I know is that our town as a whole has a lot of opinion on this. And I agree with that. Like, we need to be really careful that we're not pro ATV or we're not anti ATV. And we're catering both sides if we want to represent people of our town. If we want to hold a position and go with it, that's totally cool. But I can tell you that when I was interviewing to get elected for select board, I very clearly said I wanted to listen to what people said and, you know. 
uh, represent the people as a whole, not the people of either side. So let me ask you that. Your thought is if the ATV organization or the people that support it want village access, we should require them to do a petition to have it on the town meeting day. Oh. Yeah, I, I even would it be non binding I think that a little bit bigger to say uh, anybody who wants to change the ordinance should should go through that process. Yeah, but it will be non binding because we want to select board get the right board. Absolutely, but it would give us some. In the select board, it tends to. Yeah, we really respect. It. We, we respect yes. the vote. It would have to be because it can be. Yes. Yes. That's right. So if we're going to go that route, then we wouldn't need to have a public meeting or hearing because we've covered our information sessions and town meeting. Yeah, stuff. and uh, it'll have no value because it'll be the the vote of the voters that determine whether we. Yeah. yeah. And it would be on the ballot. Right? And it would uh, it'll be no. on the ballot. It'll be on the warrant. It'll be a regular town meeting. Well, I'm expecting it would be a regular town meeting. Oh, right. It would be valid. It would be Yeah, that would be yeah that would be, so that's not even comparing apples to apples. That's not Between true. last year and this year. I mean, town meeting's an old school thing. Not everybody can take Tuesday off. But and, that's the legal method for this town. Well, we had a one year Unless session. the town decided to go. We can make this way. But, yes, I understand. The only way you could make it a Australian ballot is if the voters. We, we vote from the floor. That's that's a statute. We'd have to say uh, change. The voters would have to change the process. But that we had discussion on the one we put last year. We did. That was a one time deal. Yeah. Micro. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's um, in statute that has to be. Right. Everything. And the voters, some number of years ago, decided that offices would be elected via Australian ballot. Okay. But everything else has to be voted before unless it's statutorily required. So I hear you and I agree with you. But to the extent of that's not even a fair comparison. Last year, I didn't have to leave my house. I got a ballot. I could check everything off. My mother in law brought a bit. But I didn't even expect everybody to take the Tuesday off. So they, you know, we know nobody shows up. That's why Nat said, well, it's on more under other business. I mean, that's. It's, it's a choice of the voters. We got no say in this. Which was Saturday. We can move the town meeting day. I would say we should definitely do that if we're going on a topic like this. That's a whole other subject. Stay so participation does not go up on Saturday. No, the fact that so it's showing sure it goes down. down. And any change of the traditional Tuesday town meeting day in towns that have done it has shown a uh, down in participation. If they went to evenings, if they went to Saturdays, and that's why a lot of towns have decided not to change because. Maybe we should find out if the voters want to go out there and now let go. That would be a good question to put on the warning this year because that um, on the warning. That would be so sad. Huh? How many things it's there? That would be sad. It would be a decision of this board to put it on come January. What a lot of towns do is have their, is if we have a, uh, an Australian ballot, we would also have to have an informational. Yeah. Uh, a lot of towns do an informational meeting on town meeting day and then ballot the next day. Well, I guess I don't know how we but the get the wishes of the voters because that seems a lot more. Uh... <laughs> we got off the ATV topic. <laughs> um, it wasn't hard to talk about this in this meeting, but it should be in the next one. I'll do a little bit more checking about what our discretion about non-binding items is. I think Eric is right that the only things that can go on the ballot are things that are specifically allowed to go on the ballot, that we can't just, that we can't add things to it. It's got to be that we have specific permission to put something on that, but I'll, I'll check and just make 
picture. Our authority, Rosemary, says that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway. So we didn't get anywhere with that. No. Yeah, yeah. So, so we still don't well, have a like Nobody was here for it. So is there, or do you want to come back to this after the trial period is over? Mm. I mean, we sort of have to, at some point, decide how we're going to proceed from the trial. Either determine that it didn't work or talk about it in our first meeting in November. Okay, we'll put it on the. Everybody get the back. I think so, and I think we should invite a few people to join us for that discussion, like Roger or somebody representing uh, the calls he's received from Johnson. So if anyone's received them, whether or not they've responded, it is a different state altogether, but they've definitely received them. Okay. And maybe we can, do we have anything that you plan for a working session? Uh, I think we're okay. We've got a couple things planned, but I think we're okay. So we'll invite. Uh, so rep from the sheriff's office. Uh, we, we want to put this on front court form and that to make sure we get public feedback. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, update on the financial security interest. Uh, you've got the you've got the updated RFP. Um, I do, do not have feedback yet on on this from uh, the league, but we'll I'll follow up with Abby. Uh, they were in the process of finding uh, their own consultant to help with some of this, so they were going to have kind of more recommendations coming up soon. Okay. Uh, but I have a, this is. Kind of the most updated copy that you've got, okay. uh, that has the the changes that we talked about. Um, and obviously, some of the dates up here are not going to be valid anymore. But you know, I, I fixed the request and I did the I added the. Uh, you know, that we want to see what it looks like before we agree to it, what's going to be in the bid. Um, I, Beth also had a suggestion about making sure that these are still the best practices that we reference in here. Uh, I'm going to need some outside assistance on that about what are the best audit, what are the best practices for uh, financial audits. All right, the next one up, Town of Johnson Fraud Prevention Policy. This is the first draft of a policy that um, I'm using the, the name of the policy as a great, it's just kind of a whistleblower protection policy. That this um, needs a little bit more work, but it, the purpose behind this is giving some idea about if you've got a suspicion of something going on, who are people that you can report to. Um, and in particular, I want to beef up this uh, investigation section about, you know, we had talked about this uh, in particular as being kind of the most important part about the, you know, the whistleblower protection is uh, providing some detail about what to expect after you make a report of what's going to happen next. Um, and I think that will add a lot to uh, security of people who want to make a report. Yeah, I think a big part of it was how the information was handled. Do you remember a lot about that discussion, Beth? Yeah, I think actually the invest like that paragraph is there for the investigation is fine, but that's only one piece of it. We need to make sure that those two people referenced above, yeah. in both the purpose and irregularity, those it needs to talk about what those two people do with the information what they share, what, what is reprimandable and what isn't, um, that kind of thing. And how do we come about those people's names? Should the public works employees choose a member and the office staff choose a member of going to or do we just randomly do? I think that we probably, 
And, you know, I think we probably designate people in a couple of different departments, like, you know, public works and office uh, and select board. So I probably actually pick three uh, or four so we can include the library also uh, and make it so, you know, at that level, kind of eliminating the chain of command so that you don't have to go to somebody within your department to make a report. Uh, you know, we talked about that as being a pretty essential thing. If you've got different people that you can talk to that give you an, an opportunity to remain anonymous. Uh, Especially if it's like their supervisor there, you know, you can't just report to your supervisor if your supervisor is the yeah. one that you have concerns about. Yeah, you've got to be able to go outside and around uh, to report it to someone else. People listed as the contacts need to have a consequence somehow, if in case of a consequence for sharing. Like, yeah, they should be a trusted person, but what happens if they don't handle that information correctly? How do you know? It's, yeah. about, it's about trust, it's about trusted people and the power that comes with being a trusted person. And there's a lot of power that comes with a trusted person. And our goal in all of this is to protect the person who's reporting something. And I just want to say out loud, because I think it's important, is um, we're all elected officials on a board. And there have been, and I will be forever, I'm sure, problems with elected officials. and. The power elected officials have. And if one of those elected officials isn't a trusted person, how does the board handle that? And the board really has their hands tied in a lot of situations because they are elected officials. And I think whatever we put in here, that needs to be clear because uh, that's tricky and it is maybe not a good solution, but it's important. So we need a consequences section. Yeah. You know, maybe that, so I'm sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. So I wanna, I will definitely have more feedback on this too, Brian, because my wheels are just keep turning on stuff like this. But- um, If you're interested, I've got a couple other model whistleblower policies. Yeah, I'm interested, definitely. Uh, this is just, Kind of a useful one that I pulled as a BLCT model policy. Yeah. But this is a BLCT. Williston, yeah, this is a for BLCT. Uh, Williston has their own, I think Winooski has one, there's a few other towns that, that have them. Uh, you know what I'd be really interested to see, Brian, is a town who modified their whistleblower policy after they had an issue with the way somebody handled um, trusted information. I, that could be very telling. I think it would be really interesting. I don't know that I'm pretty specific. Yeah. I know, but that's one of those things where if you do a search for news articles about, you're likely to find something. Yeah, do some news article, article searches and then look at when was the last time this was amended and then yeah, see if you can draw a correlation. I'm not telling you to go do that. I'm just saying, I'm just thinking out loud that yeah. like, those are the kind of things I think we should think about when we put effort into it. Who's the talent? I would do better to actually check my bookmark bookmarks on my computer, but I think it the ones that I the kind of off the top of my head, uh, I think I looked at both Williston and Nusky. Do you know any of the uh, town administrators or managers? I actually with Nusky doesn't have a manager right now. Um uh, but mayor, right? uh, it's a weak mayor. Uh, so they, they will have a manager, they just don't currently have one. Uh, I know the former manager there, uh, so I might have it in there. I'm just uh, saying, they might, to some of the questions Beth is bringing up, 
They might know some history of yeah. you know what's how it's worked well or not worked well. Yeah, and I, I do know uh, Wilson as okay. a manager there. It might be worth it. Reach down. Yeah. Yeah. So the just the first draft. So yep. more to come, but it was something that we've been interested in. So good. I wanted to include it. Good. All right. Uh, you've received the most recent couple sheriff's department reports, uh, and then we have our executive session to discuss that uh, restitution owed to the town. Jason, you have anything else you want to? No. Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> Any time. You got to be right after your report. After your report, oh. unless he's got something like, that. No. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. I mean, maybe. Maybe you should stick around, you know. Well, <laughs> the plan purchases should probably be real like that on where that falls. Because we do like the road form and report. We should almost put your plan purchases in there, Jason. Because what happens is you give your report. That's Brian probably will leave unless yeah. the board has a question for it. And they'd call it if there was a question down the line. But if you do that, your report, then you have the planning commission report, the fire plant report, and the racial justice committee report, and all that stuff to take it down to plant purchases where we actually have questions. Yeah, maybe it would be difficult to. Yeah. Really, all you have to do is give your report, which is great, print it out, and then plan the purchases. Especially when the snow's flying and you're going to be up at three. Yeah. During the winter, I mean, we'll get into that when it exposes, but during the winter, it's also okay to not make meetings too and just give the give your written report and just go home and go to bed. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to keep you here. Oh, well, that's fine. I, 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 honestly, I thought you were interested in the ATV discussion, yeah. so I didn't think anything of it. Oh, I was, but no, I didn't know how to now I have to stay full of saying Are you having fun no. on your first week? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of change. <laughs> same, same as last week. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's been okay. So you haven't made huge changes yet? No. No. Nothing <laughs> huge at all. Okay. Changing no. uh, I do uh, I do like the whole uh, we're in a problem with that and that and how we have it set up. It just makes it so there's clarity for everybody so everybody knows what's happening. So there's no question down the road why someone's done this or Good. Well, I do like it. So. Good. Hey, Jason, uh, a couple of meetings ago, Evan, or somebody mentioned there's water getting into the building. Yeah. Um, that's really something I'd be interested in, you know, seeing what we can do to prevent and correct that. Well, I looked into that. I talked to me um, and a couple other guys that were there and helped them a little bit. Yeah. I guess that, that was, used to be one building. Or somewhat one building between the two, the cold storage is way in the back. There was silos and stuff. Yeah. So it's concrete under there, all the way out to that cold storage building. They paved over. Yes. We're thinking about putting some drainage in. So. Speaking of oh, no. No, they probably have a sock that is, you know, or something like that. You know, I, I remember when it was cement all the yeah. way. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 All right, well, it's still there, I guess. They just paved over it because that's on that corner where the water problem is. The pavement's actually six inches or so above the slab in the shop. So yeah. it runs in. So maybe if we seal it up with some tires and legit. The guy that's the building guard is just going to be tiring. We try. That might at least give you a spring. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. kind of a gross thing for inside your bathroom. I would want to burn the bathroom. Well, no, we're going to the outside. Yes, so. I mean, you could do what I have in my basement, just create a throne, rebuild everything up. <laughs> well, Brian, <laughs> <and> just <laughs> we were being around with that and they have to take the, they put that like wool on plywood in the bathroom years ago and they put that tile on it. We just take that out and get down to the concrete and then maybe if you saw a cup, a hole. And put a sub pump in. So when the water comes in, it goes because the bathroom is where it all goes yeah. down, and then it migrates out into the break room into the office. So we could get it. Yeah. Yeah. Just so a it didn't come all the way in all the time. 
I didn't mean to start a big discussion, but I just want to let you know we're aware of it and I really support you know any anything that we do with us. Thanks. Captain O was there doing service on the heater, and he did. He said it was a it was a very inefficient heater for the which we talked about, which we know. Yeah. I guess this boiler has, to, which I didn't know, it has to stay hot the whole time. It's how this one is set up as an old school boiler. And he said the, new, the newer two thousand, I don't know what to call the series, is cold start boiler, and it would save drastically. No. And it wouldn't cost that much, so I didn't know if you wanted me to talk to the county. I think that there that's gonna to be too much. I don't think we're gonna we might not have to go out for a sealed fit, but we're definitely gonna to have to get multiple quotes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, our family they know the system, so that's right. and we should get fuel efficient yeah. for sure. I'll stop, but it's cheaper if you want to good night. Okay, is there any discussion before we reach the dollar and go into the executive session? No, I would entertain a motion to enter into this executive session. A motion to enter into the executive session for special to be pulled and filed by the ASA 1381. We have a motion to enter into executive session. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify the same way. Aye. 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 executive session at 929. Thank you, Don. Okay, show us out of executive session at 940. I would entertain a motion at this time. I move to approve the settlement of all the talents claimed against Hugh Albright in exchange for payment of $14,635.73 and to authorize the chair to execute a general release. We have motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. We have motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? I said it. Any further business before this board? If not, show us a journey.